Hey y'all, this is going to be lecture two, and today we're going to look at kind of social cultural impacts of the American Revolution. Um, all right, so just to kind of recap where we ended last time, we're going to stay, start to take a look at the uh, Declaration of Independence. And so I think one of the things to remember about the Declaration of Independence is that, you know, fighting had essentially already broken out. Uh, the Second Continental Congress already organized an army. You know, Washington was already in command of the army. So, you know, in 1776, Thomas Paine is going to write Common Sense, and he is really going to convince, um, you know, the, more of the country to support this Declaration of Independence. Then Jefferson is going to write the Declaration. It gets accepted. It's voted on by Congress. Um, there are changes that are made from Jefferson, and then it is issued on July 4th. So, you know, Common Sense is really one of these books that you need to know because it is, you know, so um, influential in getting to the Declaration of Independence. And um, it also kind of echoes this idea of American exceptionalism, that America is an example to the rest of the world. We have every opportunity, every encouragement before us to form the noblest, purest constitution on the face of the earth. We have in our power to begin the world over again. A situation similar to the present has not happened since the days of Noah until now. You know, there is a sense that we are, that the United States is going to engage in a creation of something that is going to be extraordinary and is going to show the rest of the world um, how to be amazing. And um, his, you know, argument is very convincing and many people start to believe that we need to declare independence. So I think, you know, to think about that the Declaration of Independence is usually considered the beginning of the American Revolution, which is not necessarily wrong, um, but we had started fighting. So why take the time to declare independence? Why write it all down? And I think one of the main purposes in writing this declaration is to, you know, seem legitimate, right? This is not just a bunch of you know, rioters. This is not just a bunch of traitors. This is not just a bunch of people violating a law. These are a bunch of people who are engaging in a higher law. These are a bunch of people who are, you know, holding fast to enlightenment thinking and the social contract. And so they're, they're drawing heavily from Locke. I'm not going to probably read this too much, but right, um, you know, he talks about the consent of the governed, the body politic. He talks about you know, private, the, the liberties of man and the state of nature. And so when we take a look at the declaration, you know, uh, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And that whenever these forms of government become destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government right? This is kind of showing legitimacy. So kind of one target audience is going to be Americans who they are trying to persuade into the patriot side, right? You are not, you know, a traitor against your king. You are holding yourself to a higher law. And so, you know, this is what is right. This is what is just. And I do like that, um, you know, they are going to target the king and not parliament, because parliament is the one who really passed a lot of these taxes that they are rebelling against. So, you know, not everyone is going to be convinced by the arguments in the declaration, and some people are going to be loyalists. Loyalists are people who um, side with the king, they side with Eng England. And if you take a look at where these loyalists are, um, they are in uh, the cities. They are in the... Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, they're in, in what is the um, East. Remember, East is the elite in this colonial setting. So if I was in like Charleston or Savannah or New York, New York is probably the biggest loyalist stronghold. These are exporting to England. You know, Boston is the exception to the rule. You know, and we looked at Boston as a specific. Boston was engaged in a lot of smuggling, right? But if I'm in Charleston, I am primarily shipping to England, Savannah to England, Norfolk to England, right? New York to England. And so a lot of these cities are like, hey, my whole lifeblood is trading with England. I'm not quite ready to 
uh, stop this relationship. Boston is the exception to that rule. So a lot of the Loyalist strongholds were in these cities. Um, but, um, you know, you get a lot of east-west division. People in the more rural areas were more willing to rebel. Um, so what are we going to do with these loyalists, right? They, seem, they, they share a lot of the basic ideology, but they see this rebellion as not legitimate. This is a endangerment of my life and my liberty and my property. Um, and they believe that they should follow the law law and not a higher law. They should, you know, be following what the king says. Um, and so loyalists end up being pretty poorly treated by both sides. Uh, the British never fully trust them and the patriots are going to seize their property and execute some. So, you know, loyalists are really one of these people, like, what do we do with them? Um, anyway. So when we do fight for independence, right, England obviously has the upper hand. They are the strongest nation in the world. They have, you know, they are uh, dominant, especially after the Seven Years' War. Um, they have a highly de developed manufacturing. They're the richest country in the world. They have the largest well-trained army and including mercenary Hessians from Germany. They have dedicated and able generals who have been at this for a very long time. Um... You know, but the colonists essentially didn't have any manufacturing. They have very little money. It's all volunteer. Uh, they have very few officers, and they are familiar with the land, right? So if you take a look at this, um, you know, this kind of like these, if you take a look at the statistics, the British are pretty confident of their victory. They're like, there's no way these ragtag colonies are going to win. Um, because of their resources. And the other thing that's not even on here is their naval supremacy. But where it gets more difficult is with their tasks. What do the British have to do to win this war is the British have to supply troops from an ocean away. And they have to crush the popular spirit of independence. Now, this is where it gets kind of weird because it's like, you know, who has to win is a really important thing. And what they have to do to win is a very important thing. It is very difficult to compel people into submission through war. Because the more violence you enact, the more you usually make more of the people who hate you, right? And I mean, we see this in American wars a lot, like the Vietnam War and these other wars. If my job is to force other people to like me or to submit to me because I'm being violent, it is a very difficult task. Um, it's, not, it's not like it's never been done. But your job is essentially to make your life so miserable that you will choose to be on my side again. Now... Um, that is what they have to do. What do the colonies have to do? They just have to survive. They just have to keep this war going long enough until the British give up and let leave them alone. That is a success for them. And so um, Britain has to essentially win the war. Um, and they do really well in the beginning of the war. B Great Britain wins in New York. They win all over the place. And really Washington, his biggest skill in the beginning is that he retreats very well. And that may sound like a joke, but when all you have to do is keep the British from winning, retreat is a really good strategy. Thomas Paine called these times the times that try men's souls. Keep engaged, don't give up. Because as long as the American people didn't give up, they were winning. And so in the very be beginning part of this war, as you know, the colonists are losing, um, it was an easy time. It was when it would have happened. And so... Um, but the other purpose of the Declaration is not just to convince Americans that they need to support the war effort. It is also to convince the rest of the world to, to support their war effort. Uh, to show the rest of the world that we are more than just a bunch of rabble who are like rising up. To get support from other countries. So in another part of the Declaration, they say the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. So if they are going to win this war, they are going to need the support of other nations. And what is the primary nation that would probably support the colonies against England? is the very country they just defeated in a war not that many years before, the French. Why go to the French? Well, Benjamin Franklin is going to go to Paris. He's going to advertise the revolution in these, like, enlightenment terms, which in these upper classes was very fashionable. Um, and I liked it. Uh, I looked this up somewhere, and they were like, he was welcomed with great enthusiasm. Well, some people think he was he was welcomed with more than enthusiasm by some of these ladies. But... You know, if you look, you know, here is Benjamin Franklin. 
He is in very plain clothes. We're going to kind of go over this later, too. Look at all these people in the French court, right? These All these people, they're very, they're nobility. They are in these, like, very fine palaces, right? And he's convincing them that they need to support the American war effort. They find him very cute. They're like, oh, look at your little bald head and your little brown plain coat, right? Um, all these people have wigs on and these beautiful dresses, right? And Ben Franklin is in the central figure, is just a plain clothed, bald headed man. Now, why do they think he was so cute? Because it was like different, right? It was very provincial of him. Um, sorry, guys. Um, so, he does convince the French to support the war effort. Um, and yeah, so the French do give their assistance. So, probably the biggest uh, assistance is from the Navy um, in the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, the French are going to uh, basically outnumber the British, and Cornwallis has no choice but to capitulate. Marquis de Lafayette is um, French, and he actually enters into the war even before the French do. And he becomes like Washington's like right-hand man, and also helps to bring revolutionary ideas back to France, which we will talk about later. So in this, uh, after the Battle of Saratoga, which was a win for the colonists, um, it convinces France that the colonies are serious enough to be formal allies, um, and the, the British are going to try to um, prevent this French and American alliance. So they start to say, like, hey, Americans, you know, we are going to get rid of all those laws you hate. Just don't get the French involved in this. But um, the French are going to uh, get an alliance in 1778, and, you know, in the Battle of Yorktown, Corn Cornwallis is going to surrender to the English and the French. I always like the kind of side fact that the, the band, as this is going down, is playing the world turned upside down. And so it is this, you know, watershed moment where things are different. So the French are going to, you know, the, the Americans play France against England to get the best terms, and they get the Treaty of Paris where we have our independence. This is revolutionary, right? Um, they're going to get all the ter territory all the way to the Mississippi River between Canada and Florida. They have fishing rights. Uh, they're supposed to kind of look out for the loyalists and British merchants, but, you know, what is different is that this is a new nation, right? And what is this new nation going to stand for? What is America going to be? And if you look back at the like declaration, people are very concerned with, you know, being this shining example, this new republic. And so to look at this like new republic, you have to look at what, what colonists kind of felt like the old world. What what did Europe stand for and what is America going to stand for? And to the Americans, the old Europe stood for corruption and patronage and standing armies and established churches and aristocracy or nobility, elitism and commerce, right? And so we are going to have like new Republican virtues, a new Republic. And this is not Republican, like what it means today as a political party, but just essentially what does it mean to be a citizen in this new country? People felt this weight of trying something completely new in this, in this, um, world. And so, um, you know, an author that writes much later kind of writes as he's traveling around the United States. There are there are things. He's a European. He's he's French, and he's like, what makes the United States different is this idea of liberty, egalitarianism, individualism, populism, and limited government. And these things are like liberty is the protection of rights. Egalitarianism is that everybody is created equal. Uh, it is a meritocracy. It's not nobility. And I think. This egalitarianism and meritocracy go together. You know, a lot of people are very confused by like, well, what was Jefferson writing about when he said all men are created equal if he owned slaves? Well, what he's talking about is he's going against this idea of nobility, of this privileged class. And that is the big kind of groundbreaking thing. Populism is this idea that citizens should be um, have more power, you know, going to this idea of democracy and limited government. The government should not be involved in as much as possible. One place you can look for this uh, Republican s simplicity is in culture and class, right? You know, Americans, as they come into these rural colonies, you have like homespun linen and wool. They're concerned about practicality. On the, on the eve of the revolution, you do have a lot of like um, southern colonies and like in the cities, they did have styles that mimic those in Europe. And that was part of, 
you know, people buying things from Europe, like they would get these dolls that had like little fashion, you know, models on it. And people really wanted to emulate the fashions of England. But then when we get to the revolution, it becomes revolutionary to kind of shun those styles, right? So like I said before, when Franklin is going to France, he's wearing like a little like beaver hat and like an old torn up suit. Why? Because he wants to kind of exemplify Republican simplicity, that Americans are not concerned with your like styles and nobility. We are not even trying to aspire to that. You know, um, when you take a look at Marie Antoinette and how she celebrated American independence, she, this woman like goes to a ball and puts like a boat on her head and she's like, oh, look at me. It's so great that America has independence. Well, yes, you know, Marie Antoinette, you are putting a boat on your head in this like noble style going to balls. But what is going to happen to poor Marie Antoinette a few years later is the French Revolution. These same American ideals are going to come back to chop her head off. So, you know, another example of this is like Yankee Doodle Dandy. So it's like, you know, Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. All right. So what is the deal with this song? Um, you know, to me, it's like when someone makes fun of you and then you kind of like, you take it in and then you like, you kind of own it. I don't know. I don't know a better way. The best example is when I was younger, people would make fun of my sneakers for not being very fashionable, not being Adidas or Nike. They were from like, I don't know, Payless Shoes or something. And so people would call them Bobos. But then what would you do when, when you would scream back at them? You'd be like, Bobos, they look so fine. Bobos cost $1.99. Right, you would try to like kind of own it. You'd be like, yeah, they're bobos, but I'm proud of my bobos. Well, anyway, Yankee Doodle Dandy is essentially the English calling the Americans bobos, right? They were like, Yankee is, you know, English. It's a colonial term. Doodle is a dumb person. So it's like these dumb Americans are like walking around and sticking a feather in their hat and they are calling it macaroni. Like it's like very fashionable. See so all like dumb hicks put a feather in your hat and you think that you're like these high class people. Now, to Americans though, they were like, listen, right? This was a song that was made during the French and Indian War to make fun of Americans. But Americans then use this song to kill English people because they're like, yes, we are unfashionable hicks and yes, we are going to kill you because we don't want to be this macaroni. Like, look at this stupid hat. Look at these stupid clothes. Look at that stupid smirk on his face. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be a simple American, you know, you know, citizen. And that is what I'm fighting for. I don't want to, your stupid macaroni. And so we use this song that was used to make fun of us. And then we kind of throw it back at them. Um, and so that is probably the biggest thing about class is that Americans are challenging the idea of nobility, um, but we have a lot of other issues. Women, right, um, the Daughters of Liberty, when we talk about like Republican simplicity and boycotts, this idea of patriotism not being fashionable, you know, not buying into English goods, you know, not buying tea, not buying nice clothes, not buying all these things, it becomes a, a thing. Um, during the war, and we could go back to those boycotts, you know, the Daughters of Liberties were like, uh, rather than freedom, we'll part with our tea, as well as our love of the draft when arise, American patriots, our tastes we deny, right? So women's biggest like, contribution is while we are boycotting all these goods from England, they have to take up the slack. They have to be the ones to make the homespun cloth. They have to be the ones to, you know, figure out what to make when they're not making tea, you know? Um, they are the ones who are making a lot of the decisions to boycott goods. This uh, are, this this uh, cartoon is actually making fun of, I would say it's like patriotic ladies, like, you know, oh look, they're being patriotic. Their children are being neglected as they're like trying to be political. Um, they're signing a petition like, look, we're going to be political. We're going to sign a petition not to drink tea. And of course, there's like all this like lustiness going on. The woman with the most par power is ugly, but in the back, my favorite part is they're signing a, a, a petition to get rid of tea and like everyone's drinking giant bowls of tea before they decide that they are going to uh, boycott tea. Anyway, um, so this is being pretty critical of these women's like, oh yeah, you guys are doing a whole lot by boycotting this, but it is the thing that was happening during the time. 
You could take a look at someone like Sarah Franklin, who, you know, organized a Philadelphia, raises money for soldiers. She is going to, uh, you know, buy shirts. She's going to actively support the cause. You know, most women, overwhelming majority of women, are going to support the war effort, but they're going to stay within their gender roles. They're going to be cooks. They're going to be nurses. They're going to be all of these things for the war. They're going to be supporting the war effort through their, like, consumerism. The, there's a few notable exceptions, which you might see in a print. Uh, one is Deborah Sampson, who cross-dressed, and the other is Molly Pitcher, who, like, took up her husband's gun while, when he fell. I think that's the picture that's right there. Very few and far between. Most women are going to support it in other ways. Now, what changes after the war goes to this thing called Republican motherhood. So, you know, the people are really concerned about, like, we want to live in a nation that is, like, promoting democracy, it's promoting uh, equality and our virtues. And so who is going to be the one to teach people how to be good American citizens is going to be the women. So this idea of Republican motherhood is the idea that women's role is to raise righteous children, to, you know, create a new class of citizens that know how to be good democratic citizens. And so women are going to become more literate. They're going to be uh, more involved in, you know, I'm not say more involved in family. They're, they're going to have a different role in their families. And so people are, they want children to grow up in democratic households. And so they start to look at this idea of the family dynamic and how it needs to change in order to promote democracy. And so if your like son comes up to you and he's like, dad, you know, why do I have to do this thing? And he's like, because I told you, right? So if you have this sort of like patriarchal, you know, like system to your family where what the man says go, the man is the king of the castle in his house, right? That actually is teaching children to submit to tyranny. It's teaching children that it's okay to live in a system where like whatever the person on top says goes. And that's not a democracy, that's a monarchy. So People want to try to change the dynamics of the family so that it is more democratic. And so women are seen more as partners um, and equal partners in a relationship. So they are supposed to have a say in the family. They are supposed to be in charge of raising righteous children. They are supposed to be sort of in charge of the household. Now, men are going to be kind of more in charge of politics and the outside world. And women are more in charge of like the family and the inside world. They are separate but equal sort of. I mean, I don't want to say that, but separate but equal. They are in different spheres, right? Um, but they're, they're supposed to be seen more as equal. They're supposed to be seen as more of like a relationship rather than just in this like pyramid scheme or what the, the man says goes. And that is sort of like Republican motherhood. But that being said, while they might be in a more equal relationship in, in a relationship wise, as far as leg legality, women lost their citizenship. Well, they lost their like legal personhood. They didn't lose their citizenship, but they lost their legal personhood when they became married. This is called the idea of like femme cover. On your wedding day, you relinquish control of your property. You basically cease to be a person and you are under the identity of your husband. Um, and so, you know, people are going to be challenging this over time, but after the American Revolution, women still could not own property if they are married. You actually had more rights if you were a single woman than if you were married. So, you know, Abigail Adams is probably one of the perfect examples of, like, Republican motherhood. She was, she kind of, like, felt like she was able to challenge her husband. She felt equal in the relationship. During the war, she had you know, contributed to the war effort. She did all of these things. And when Abigail Adams writes to John, while he is at the um, declaration, he she says, remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable, favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember that all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention are not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion, right? So, Men are increasingly getting all of the rights. Women are being left out. John Adams is going to say, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. Depend upon it. We will know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Meaning, you're not going to get anything in this revolution. This is for us, right? So family-wise, we're going to get Republican motherhood, but legality-wise, women do not gain much. So in class, um, 
you know, we looked at it before as far as this idea of like going against nobility. But, you know, women weren't the only ones who couldn't vote. You had to own property to vote. Weirdly, in some some ways, some women who owned property in some areas, if they weren't married, they could actually vote before some other laws were passed. So, you know, you had to own property to vote. So if you are married, you can't own property, you can't vote. And um, you had to own more property, run for office. And so, you know, this is not going to change after the revolution. It is not like poor folks gained a lot of rights. Uh, many of the founding fathers, the people who are signing the, the Declaration and later the Constitution, these folks are going to be upper class. And so you have Thomas Jefferson and, and many, many, many others who are wealthy plantation owners and slave owners. And even the people up north, these are merchants and wealthy, wealthy printers. And there's class rebellions. And I think we're going to look at Shay's Rebellion again. But Shay's Rebellion is going to be a rebellion of poor folk against rich folk. And it kind of shows that this idea of like no taxation without representation and this idea of like fighting against uh, an unjust tyranny of, you know, is continues. And people saw this in terms of class. So Daniel Shays is in the uh, West, right? Remember, a lot of the rich folks during the, um, and I mean, this kind of happens still today. Rich folks tend to live in the East in this time on the coast, right? And so these are the elite. These are going to be the merchants. And in the back, you have a lot of rural farmers. These are the more kind of poor folks. And in these kind of, in the like, in the uh, West part of Massachusetts, you have poor farmers who are in debt. And so in Boston and these elites, they're going to be like, we are in debt after the war. We need to get some money. What are we going to tax? We're going to tax the land. All right. And so when you take these property taxes, these farmers are in debt, they can't pay their property tax. What they do is they end up in debt or prison. They end up with their land taken away. And when their land is taken away, they can't vote. And so um, what are these farmers going to do? Well, they're going to kind of rebel against Boston. They're going to burn down courthouses. And these are the same farmers who, um, you know, fought in the American Revolution. And they see a con con continuity, right, with this, like, current taxation. And they're going to say, we need to keep going. And so, you know, as far as class, for many folks, there were no changes. Race is a whole other issue, right? African Americans are going to serve in the American military. They did not want to have blacks in the military at first, but... Later, Washington authorizes them. You have to remember, Washington is also a slave owner. Um, and he realizes he could not have won the war without him. And many in the Navy are going to be African Americans. And this continues for a very long time. So it's not just America that stood for freedom, right? If you were enslaved, England actually might have been your better bet. Lord Dunmore is going to make a proclamation at the beginning uh, in 1775 or 1776. I can't remember. He says, essentially, if your uh, owners are in rebellion, you can come to the English side and you will be freed. And this is Lord Dunmore's proclamation. His intent in doing this was to stop slave owners from rebelling. He's like, if you rebel, I will take away your slaves. Now, what it does, in fact, is make slave owners more mad. How dare you threaten to take away my slaves? So, you know, Lord Dunmore tried to stop slave owners from rebelling by saying, we'll take your slaves, and he starts to get slave owners mad. Now, some folks are going to take advantage of this um, and go to the English side and actually fight for the English and get freedom. And also, many folks take advantage of the chaos to um, run to freedom. But there are examples of a, an ex-slave who fled to the British side and fought a guerrilla war against um, Thai, who fought a guerrilla war against the colonies, the Black Brigade. He captured militia leaders and burned down the plantation of his old master. So, you know, to some right? The English were more the side of freedom. Um, race, um, you know, one thing you can never get around, and we always talk about it today, is, is this idea of all men being created equal. Whether we live up to, to it at the time, um, the words are put on paper, and it creates a moral problem that the founders have to grapple with, that the people who are, you know, making this nation have to grapple with. And so it does make it a moral dilemma. Um, one thing I'd never like to see people write is that, like, you know, when Jefferson said all men are created equal, he never thought about slaves. Well, he thought a lot about slaves, and as he saw in Kendi, he just came up to some really messed up ideas about slavery. Um, and so a lot of folks do say we need to get rid of slavery 
and they've pointed out we need to get rid of slavery if we are going to live up to these words. Uh, one famous person is uh, Banneker, who writes to Jefferson on racism. Although you are so fully convinced of the goodness of the father of mankind, you should go against his will by detaining by fraud or violence so many of our brothers under groaning ca captivity and oppression. Right? He is calling Jefferson out. You are going against the truths that you wrote down in the Declaration, and you know it, right? Um, how can you claim that we are doing God's duty, and then you're going to enslave people? So people are calling Jefferson out on it, and it is making slavery this moral dilemma. And some states do decide to go with what's called gradual uh, emancipation. So Pennsylvania is the first. So you have to think, a lot of people say, well, slavery still existed after the war. It didn't change. But it did change because before the war, all colonies had slavery before the war. So after the war, some states do not have slavery. It is a change, right? Uh, that being said, New England and the Middle Atlantic states abolished slavery, um, but it is gradual. So even by 1810, there's 30,000 slaves in the northern states. And the Northwest Ordinance is also going to prohibit slavery. So the way people tended to get around this moral dilemma um, is that they, they kind of put the two rights against each other. So while you might be claiming that this is liberty, I am claiming that I am, as a slave owner, protecting my property rights, which is one of the natural rights. So that's how a lot of the slave owners try to protect their um, stuff. So, you know, you could take a look at what is revolutionary after the war, what is the change, and what is... Uh, what is not revolutionary? What is a continuity? So this ideal of equality and liberty, this is challenging the norms of nobility and started the process of, you know, making the races more equal, right? We are well in the midst of that. Republican simplicity, um, Republican motherhood, these are all changes. Many African Americans are freed either by running away or manumissions. A lot of like individual slave owners did free their slaves after the war because of this moral dilemma. And, um, yeah, oh, anyway, that's doubled up. Um, there are still class divisions. Um, the poor still feel oppressed by taxation. Uh, women and African Americans are denied the right to vote. And those without property, right? A lot of folks were not included in this democracy. Married women cannot own property and lost their identity after married. And slavery is still legal in the South. All right, so um, that is it. I will see you guys later.